Okay, it looks like the broadcast is firing up and we are getting ready to go live, which is exciting. And um, it's interesting, as I've said before, because the, that what I'm seeing on my camera with the screen facing me and what shows up over here, there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, so anyway, we are up and running. And um, I'm going to talk about this in a minute here. Um, I'm just going to let people get a chance to get signed on here. Hey, um, Hunting and Fishing 603, you've been commenting a lot lately. I appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in. Dustin, hey, how you doing? Uh, John, what's up? Lewis, what's going on, brother? Window 1223, how you doing? So people are signing on and people are getting this broadcast in a lot of different areas. And I'm going to mention this again because there's going to be people filtering in over time here. I am a one-man show. I don't have a camera crew. I'm doing all this by myself. It's a little bit of a lot to manage in some respects. Um, and this feed is going out in a lot of different destinations. So I'm not sure where you're tuning in. But I have a computer here. You can see it just in the corner of the screen there. And I'm, I'm monitoring my YouTube channel Sean's Outdoor Adventures and my name is spelled S-E-A-N. It's funny how many people lately have been writing to me and spelling my name a different version and I always chuckle. Uh, but anyway, it's Sean's Outdoor Adventures on YouTube. So even if you want to watch it where you're currently at, you know, a Facebook page or wherever it is, bring up my YouTube channel in another window or something and when you're ready to ask a question, Put it on there because that's going to make it easier for me to find it and answer it. Last time after the feed was over, um, I was trying to quick write answers to questions I didn't get to in my channel even. And then later on, I checked out some other locations like Facebook and places like that. And there were people posting questions on those outlets. And again, I'm not monitoring them, so I tried to answer some of those after the fact. I may not always be able to do that, uh, but I do my best to answer questions. So if you, you know, have um, any questions, please pop over to my YouTube channel and check with me there. That would be really helpful. Um, so... It looks like we've got some people. We're up and running. We're a couple minutes in. So I want to go ahead and get started. And tonight, the, the topics, the two main topics is really trail camera use and the early season. And what I mean by the early season is like the first week of the hunting season in your area where you're going to be hunting. And the reason why I want to focus on this right now is because my personal strategies for that first week are different than the weeks following, especially when you get toward, now my hunting season in Pennsylvania always begins in October, right around that first week of October. It's the same with where I hunt in New York. Maryland's a little different. I do hunt in Maryland. They open almost a full month earlier. They're, they're kicking in in September. Uh, but the, my point is, my strategy in that first week, whether I'm in Maryland or in Pennsylvania, New York, is pretty much the same. But then you got to start to modify the plan in a lot of situations as you get into those following couple weeks. So I want to talk about that. And, and I really want to kick this off by talking a little bit about trail cameras. So I'm going to talk about trail cameras. And then I'm going to move over to the board to draw out some examples for the early season. And when I get over to the board, I am going to address the whole map reading challenge thing and how you, the viewer, can win a Bowtech Range 6 and some other prizes like an XOP tree stand. I'm going to address that too when I get over the board because I've been getting a lot of questions and I want to try to clarify some of that as I can throughout the series. And um, I'm also going to throw this in real quick. The next, next week's episode, I want to talk about the pre-rut, meaning the week before the rut comes in 
and the rut. So originally I was going to do those as two separate episodes, but in order to fit some more content in before the season starts, I'm going to condense them down into one episode and that's going to be next week. So the pre-rut and the rut. Maybe if I have time, I'm also going to talk about that time period between the early season, the first week of the season and the pre-rut because there's that, a lot of people call that the mid-season lull, L-O-L. -L. Uh, it's so weird pronouncing that sometimes. Um, so the mid-season lull is there's a, some strategies that you can implement to help you remain successful during that time period. So, um, and the last thing before I get into truck terms, I'll say this. I'm going to be checking questions at like toward the end. So if you want to wait until right when I'm ready to ask your question, that would be helpful because a lot of people, you know, make comments and stuff in the in the feed for this on my channel. And if you question, if you throw a question out now and a bunch of people comment after that, I might not be able to find it, you know, when other questions are coming in down below. So make sure you, you save your question until I'm, I'm saying, hey, throw your questions in now. Or if I'm starting to address questions and you feel like maybe yours is too early and I'm not seeing it, put it on there again. All right, so let me address trail cameras. Um, trail cameras are an incredible resource they have been a game changer for so many of us in the hunting world. I mean, I grew up before hunting, before trail cameras even existed. And, um, you know, I remember when my neighbor caught, got this thing, it was a trail timer. And this was a, a huge uh, piece of information. What it was was a string that you tied on one tree and you hooked it into this little device on another tree. And it, it kept the time until that was kicked off by a deer or something, and then it stopped the time. So you would be able to see what time of day did an animal walk down that trail. And that was huge for us. And I mean, that's back in the early 1990s. And I, as some of you may already know, I've been hunting for like 30 years. I'm older than I look and um, reaching that mid forties range. So I have a lot of experience and getting into trail cameras. And this is something that somebody asked me recently. And Dan, if you're watching, this is, Related to your question, he, he said, if there's a pie chart, how big of a slice of that pie does trail camera use fit in that with your hunting regime or your plan? And um, I don't necessarily know how big the pie piece is, but I do think it's a piece of the pie that I do not want to live without because we have that now. And trail cameras give you information around the clock when you're not there to really help you make a game plan. And what I mean is, I don't care if you're getting the biggest buck in the world at your spot. If that buck is coming through there at two in the morning, you're not going to get that buck. I mean, unless it's during the rut and the buck's cruising around, but we're talking about the early season right now. And so for the early season, you're not going to get the buck if he's coming through at two in the morning. And so, you know, I can't hunt right here and expect this buck to come during shooting hours. I mean, there's always a chance, but if he's coming through regularly, that, but that information is huge. Cause if you've got buck rubs everywhere and scrapes and, but you're never seeing the deer, it's like, well, why not? And that's because he's not coming through until the middle of the night. Like I used to guide over 10, like 10 years ago, I was a guide out in Illinois for an outfitter and we all had different pieces of land that we managed as guides and there was guys that were guiding people on other pieces of land not the one i was running and they had rubs and scrapes everywhere and they were setting their hunters up on it and no one ever saw a deer at all during the day at those spots and back then we we didn't have trail cameras either and this is going back quite a, quite a few years um, and it would have been helpful to, if we were getting all nocturnal movement, we would have said, Hey, don't set your hunters there because the deer are coming through in the middle of the night. So what I'm hoping you're realizing real clearly is that trail cameras are very helpful to give you useful information, but there's some do's and don'ts that I think will help you keep your hunting spot pristine and ready to be hunted. One thing, um, and, and I'm going to throw this in too, before I say what I was about to say. I was going out to set a trail camera up on public land and I'm in Pennsylvania. You're not allowed to bait 
Um, I, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do any of that on public land. You're not allowed to put bait out or I know you're not allowed to put minerals out or any of that kind of stuff. It's not allowed. And, uh, and so what I do when I'm setting trail cameras on public land is I look for good trail crossings where they intersect. Because a lot of times deer will slow down and sniff a little bit when they're coming on a major intersecting corridor to see, you know, if they're, what deer were moving the other direction. So I look for those key intersections and I set my camera up there. Or I look for a blown down log so the deer might stop for a moment and step over the log and I might get a picture of them, you know, when they slow down to stop. Because a lot of your cheaper cameras, the trigger isn't real fast and so you might get a lot of empty pictures or the tail end of a deer so you don't know if it was a buck or not and so you need something that's going to slow them down especially in public land where you're not allowed to put minerals out but let me say this i was running cameras on this new piece of public land that i was checking out this year and um, i was getting all daytime pictures morning middle of the day evening i mean i don't i might have had one nighttime picture and that was it and I was going in there to set up another camera because I was looking for a spot for my dad, which ended up getting stolen. And some of you who follow my channel, you know, heard when I mentioned that. Um, but anyway, there was a guy walking in to set up trail cameras as well. And he openly admitted to me that he puts out stuff to attract the deer. And um, what he also said was, you're going to find when running cameras in here that all of your pictures are nocturnal. The deer just don't move during the day. And um, I, I was like, uh, you're wrong. And, but the reason why he was getting all nocturnal pictures is because on public land that deer get a lot of pressure, they are sensitive. So when you start putting stuff out to attract them, they get nervous sometimes and they don't come in until it's dark. And so you might be ruining your hunting spot in some situations if you're putting out attractants and you're getting all nighttime pictures it's because you're doing something that is altering the deer's behavior and i'm not saying that's the case everywhere i mean there's a lot of my buddy has a lease he runs minerals all year long he gets all kinds of daytime pictures of the of the deer the bear and everything else so you know but when you're when you're dealing with a high pressure situation deer that live on public land in an area that gets a lot of hunting pressure they start to feel the human activity now they're starting to alter if they're getting a lot of pressure from human activity now like in, with the cameras and everything, they will begin to change their patterns. And that's what I'm, that's really where I want to go with this. You have to be careful if you're running cameras, even if it's on unhunted private land, if you're not careful and it's a situation where the deer are spooky, then you could be ruining your spot before the season even starts. I think it was last year or the year before, I had a guy from, I think it was West Virginia or Virginia, who was, he was still kind of a new hunter. He was all excited. He was getting these big bucks on his trail cameras. And this is what he said. He was like emailing me what he was doing. He's like, yeah, I really want to put the work in this year. I want to get a big buck. I'm checking my cameras every week. So in his mind, he's like, oh, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to check my cameras regularly. And that is a huge mistake. Because the more you go in there to check cameras, the more you are alerting deer, especially mature deer. Now, I mean, sure, you're going to see on TV these big farms out in the Midwest. I mean, they, they're used to farmers and stuff, so there's human activity that the deer are somewhat accustomed to. So a person in that situation would be smart to drive a four-wheeler out to the camera and not even get off of it to check the camera because you're not leaving your, you know, stepping with your foot on the ground. But um, for a lot of us, like public land, you're not allowed to do that. And so my recommendation is this. After years of running cameras on public land, I would give you a two or three week window be between checking cameras. I, I used to go longer than that, but I don't anymore. And the main reason for that is if you have a camera failure or I have black bear in, like crazy where I hunt. And a lot of times I've had them rip the camera off the tree. I've had them destroy the camera. And so I've gone back a month later all excited thinking I'm going to have all this great data. And the camera is ripped to shreds with claw marks. And I have the last pictures I have of our black bear right in the camera with its mouth open and mangling the camera. So um, I went like a month or two 
without checking the camera and now I lost all that time where I could have had data. So two to three weeks is my recommendation. If it's possible, try to check the camera right before or even during a rainstorm to try to wash as much human, away, human odor away as possible that you could possibly leave. Now, this is being like really extreme. Like if you really wanna do the best you can to keep your spot nice, this is what I recommend. You can check your camera and get away with it. I mean, I know a lot of people that don't do any of this stuff and they still seem to get away with it, but I'm talking from the perspective of hunting deer that are sensitive to human activity and the more you go in there to check the camera, the more they are beginning to pattern you and you could be ruining your spot before opening day even gets there. Opening day comes and you're like, what happened to all those bucks I was watching? <laughs> it could be partly you. But now I want to transition into my early season tactics. And as part of it, I also want to mention this. Over the years, I've observed this. I've listened to stories and it's been made clear. There are a lot of situations where buck will change their pattern right around the month of August. The August 20th, 21st and on. You might have a buck all year, all summer long on your camera and then... Come the end of August, it's like, what happened to that deer? Well, one, you could have spooked it by checking your camera too much. That's always possible. But also, it's possible that the buck just changed his, his core territory. They actually can do that throughout the season. And I've even had spots where the bucks don't even show up until almost the late season. I have my friend John Ortlieb. He's been in some of my, um, my episodes. He was with me in the very beginning over 20 years ago when I first started filming hunts, he was my cameraman and I filmed for him too. And, um, you know, for John, um, he, his spot on his lease, I mean, he runs cameras all summer long, but the good bucks don't seem to show up until in October. So he's like mid-October, all of a sudden he's got all these big bucks showing up. And the point is they can change their core territories for different reasons. It could be food sources, it could be moving into the, the mating season, the bucks are preferring to hang out, the are higher, and so just keep that in mind. If you're excited about a big buck you're getting pictures of now, there's a chance come the season he's not even gonna be there. So, um, <laughs> I'm gonna mention this too. I found this shed like a couple weeks ago, and it's pristine, I mean, it, it's not even, like normally like rodents and mice and stuff eat the sheds up in the winter time but the place where I found this has an extremely high rattlesnake population and so because the snake population is so high I imagine the rodent uh, population is very low and so this shed never got a nick not a nibble from a rodent where normally in the winter time they nibble on it. And it's funny because I hung a trail camera six yards away from this, this shed and I went back like a month later to check the camera and like I, it was a little bit of an opening and all the bushes were swaying and I had like 4,000 pictures. It was a junky camera so everything triggered it. And um, you know, so I was like, I gotta, I gotta take this camera out of this, this opening and go put it somewhere where there's not so many bushes. And in doing so, I walked in a direction that I didn't when I set the camera up, and I almost stepped on this shed like a few yards away. And I, I took video of it, I'll share it in a future episode. But um, let's go over to the board, and um, what I want to do while we're over here is, I've been getting a lot of questions about the map reading challenge stuff, because viewers are going to have an opportunity to win Yes, you, person watching right now, could win a brand new Bowtech Rain 6. You choose the color, whatever, however you want it. Um, and so there's that opportunity for you. And as a result of that, I've had a lot of questions. I aired a video uh, to introduce it this past week. I put it in a card. If you're on my YouTube channel, I put it in one of the, one of the videos in the card um, that you can click on the icon in the top right corner, and it shows you a couple videos. It's one of those for more details. But... Here's the bottom line for you, the viewer. Um, there's going to be 12 guys in the map reading challenge this year, and they're all fighting for some of these top prizes. And your involvement is important for these guys. So in addition to the score that they get during the hunt, 
the number of views that you give their videos, they're gonna, there's going to be a scout trip video and a hunting video on each guy. And all of those views are going to be added up and added to his total score. And the person with the highest score is going to win the Bowtech Range 6 for them. But when you, and here's how you get in it, there's also going to be a voting board. So Bowtech's going to be setting up a page for these guys. It's not set up yet. The, the, the scout trips are probably going to start airing a month from now. So right here we are, it's August 16th. I would say right around the middle of September, and we're going to have more of these live shows before then. I can give you updates when we're going to get ready to air those. It's going to be when those videos are beginning to air that you can then vote. When you vote on a guy, you know, you sign up and you vote. Your name goes in the lottery for you to be drawn to be the winner of the of the Botac for the viewers. So we we want we're a community. You know, um, I'm a YouTube producer if you want to call it that. And on my channel, if you haven't been on it before, check it out. I try to respond to people on the comments to the best of my ability, and I view it as a community. Like we are in this together. And so that's what we want. We want to grow our community, you know. And as part of that, you're part of what these guys are doing. You know what I mean? You're the support system. So voting for them and watching their videos helps them. It helps me continue to produce videos and videos that people are liking. I, I want people to watch them. So it, it's all, it's all, everything is good. It's all good, as they say. So that's how you can win a Bowtech. If you're on my email, my newsletter email list, uh, I have a website, seansoutdooradventures.com, and I have a newsletter. At the bottom of any page, you can sign up for the newsletter. And I'm going to be putting out, a, in my newsletter, a thing for people who are interested to sign up who are watching the series, and I'm going to do a drawing for stuff like um, XOP hooked us up. Some of the grand prizes that these guys can win is an XOP hang-on tree stand. And that's going to be made possible by your views and votes again. But I'm going to do a lottery as well. And, and those of you who sign up for my newsletter, I'm going to be drawing an, an one of those names out to win the tree stand and also a bow case from the Island Company. All right. So hopefully that clears up some of the questions. We're going to be, it's going to be set up that you can vote once a day for these guys if you want. Like if you really have a guy you want to see win and you want to really help, I mean, one of the best ways is to, to share his videos around on your social media and tell your friends to share it because you can really crank up the views. But you can also vote for the person once a day. Now, your name only goes into the lottery one time, even if you vote on them 15 times. It's just once. So um, I just want to clear that up. And now let's make some room for our strategy here. Now, as we look at the early season, I want to give two perspectives hunting pressured land, which is a lot of times public land, and unpressured land. Like if you own your own piece of ground, 100 acres, whatever it is, you can consider that, if you're the only person hunting it, you can consider it unpressured unless you're the one pressuring it to the point where you're spooking up the deer. Let me give you an example. When I guided in Illinois, I managed a 127 acre piece of land. I had two hunters a week. And I did my best to rotate the land, the, where the hunters were, to keep each area as fresh as possible. And my hunters usually saw anywhere from 12 to 40 deer on a sit. You know, they didn't always see a shooter. And a lot of times they didn't see a shooter, but they were seeing plenty of deer. And then the owner of the whole outfit had a friend that had some kind of a share in the land, some, not even that piece, but a different one. And the landowner, the, the, outfitter I was working for gave this guy permission to hunt wherever he wanted on my piece that I was managing and the guy had a decoy and spent the whole week in one tree stand with the decoy the first day he saw almost 40 deer the second third day he still saw some deer he was doing a lot of rattling calling in little bucks and by the fourth or fifth day not one single deer he didn't see one single deer and my hunters Anytime I tried to put them even remotely in that area of the property, they didn't see deer. And that was my best spot. That was the 40 deer a sit spot. And I, I mean, I had one hunter who was loaded up on doe tags, shot three doe in like 15 minutes out of that, you know, that area. So the point is one person ruined that whole stretch of the, of the forest. So you, if you don't hunt your land properly, you could be 
the pressure that ruins your property. So anyway, uh, first I want to talk about uh, pressured land and early season. I like to identify my food source and focus on that. And I, in the early season, I focus a lot on evening hunts. A lot of us who work, I don't, I'm a stay-at-home dad, so I don't necessarily, I, um, but a lot of people do. And so they, they have evenings to hunt. So let's say this is a field right here. I'm going to talk about a field as a food source, and then I'm going to talk about something like oak trees in the middle of a forest as a food source. So there's a little bit of a different strategy for both. And I'm going to keep an eye on my time, you know, because we only have so much time here tonight. But let's say this is, um, this is a field, okay? Now, one thing for you to consider, let's pretend this is all forest around here. And for the sake of this example, I live in a mountainous area, so it's very hilly. Let's just say that the top of the mountain is up here. So let me get a black marker. So let's just call this top of mountain, top mount. Okay, and so if deer want to, a lot of times deer like to bed down high on the mountains, it gives them, gives them a good vantage point. And I talked about that in the first episode on playing the wind and thermals. Um, and so a lot of times the deer are going to come down to something like a crop field for food in the evening. In the early season, they still often show up when there's a lot of daylight. And what I like to do, and there's a lot of public land around where I live where it's behind fields and stuff. And when these fields are soybeans, a lot of times I'll pull up on the road down here with my binoculars, just, you know, that last hour of light, and I'll just sit there, if I can, in the car if it's not a busy road, or, or maybe I'll ride my mountain bike, you know, to that spot from a parking area and then ride closer and then sit on the, with my bike on the side of the road, and I'll glass the field and I'll watch where the deer are coming into the field, okay? is going into that the beginning of the season as much as you can stay out of your hunting spot as possible is going to be good for you the more you're into the hunting world the more you're going to hear this as the start of someone's story of their big buck it was my first time in that stand and then the story continues let me say it again it was my first time in that stand so often your best chance of harvesting a good deer is the first time in, and that's because you haven't alerted the deer with your scent. Whether it was walking in or the wind catch shifting on you while you're in the stand and um, you know messing you up. I just got a text message. Let me make sure there's not an issue. Oh, it's my friend Corey who's in the Map Reading Challenge. Um, sorry for the interruption there. But anyway, getting back to what I was talking about, um, I think is what I was saying, as much as you can stay out of your hunting area to, to make your first sit the sit, um, the better off you are. And so let's say you can't even hunt this field, just as an example. You can watch where are the deer coming into the field. And very often, this is what I observe. Let me just erase these real quick. Now, I live in hilly terrain, so even though the hill comes down like this, there's still like spurs and bumps and draws across here, let's say. And let's say that the high point, like it's, it kind of goes across, there's a high point coming into the field right here. A lot of times, if the deer don't have the wind in their favor, let's say there's a thermal or a wind that's coming like this, it's coming down the hill, the deer can't wind anything in that field. And so their best vantage point for entering the field is the highest point, whether it's here, or here or here a lot of times they like that highest point because they can see down into the other areas so your your good deer they come up to the edge of the woods and they just survey the field like if it's a soybean field or some other grassy field with something other than corn because corn they can go in there and disappear and they they feel safe right away so it's different with corn but when you're when you're dealing with something that you can see the deer and the deer can see in the field they, they look for these advantages. And so a lot of times I've observed deer coming in on those high points. Now, for you in the early season, I focus on the food sources and I want to hunt kind of close to them because I call them epicenters. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's deer bedded over here and deer bedded over here and deer bedded over here and deer bedded here. And they're all going to that food source in the evening. But if this is one of the advantages for entering the field, you might have this happening.
So this gives you the best chance at harvesting deer. You're near where they're all wanting to go. Now, when you start to move away from the primary food source, and again, the early season, a lot of times they're still showing up with daylight. We're close to it. So a lot of times what they might do is they might hang out up in here eating acorns or browse, waiting for the, it to get dark. But if you're in that area, you know, you're still in the chips. And so the key is, and it's obvious when you have a crop field, but where is my key food sources? Now the deer over here, they might be doing something else. They're, they're probably not looping all the way back over to come in over here. So if your big buck, you know, is bedded over here that day, and you're set up here, you're, you're just not going to be getting a shot most likely. Unless you get lucky, it comes out in the field, you call them over. But that's not, not always going to be the case in the early season because they're not all fired up just yet. I mean, you, they can come over. In early season, bucks do like to meet up in bachelor groups. So if you want to call, um, and I talked about calling the last time, but I would just use grunting. And if the grunting doesn't work, I might use, if I have a rattle antler or bag, I would do soft sparring in the early season to see if I can get some interest for them to come over, but that's it. I'm not getting aggressive, I'm not throwing snort wheezes, and I'm not calling excessively, just a little bit. And if he's not responding, I let it go. Because you gotta look at it like a chess game. If you're hunting a good buck, you gotta think, okay, it might not be tonight, but I don't wanna destroy my hunting spot. I don't wanna to totally give away my best tree stand location. And so I gotta play it gentle. And I don't wanna spook this buck off. So, it, you know, if it's a spot that you're gonna be hunting, you might even wanna just let him go that night and just say, all right, he, he didn't come my way tonight. I'm gonna to try to get out of here without getting detected and save it for another day. So that's all part of the strategy. We're not being aggressive. This is my suggestion anyway. And I'm looking for the epicenter. If there's an area that the deer want to really enter the food source. Now let's say this. The deer are still in our same locations over here. But let's say the wind is coming this way. Okay. In my experience, there are deer that are habitual. If, if there's deer that, that, like especially doe, doe, they get on patterns and sometimes they just lock on them. If there's a doe that wants to enter the field there every day, she might do it even if the wind isn't perfect. But a lot of your smarter and warier deer, they're going to be favoring the downwind side of the field. So a lot of these locations, and you got to remember, deer are often not in a rush to get to where they're going. So deer that are bedded way over here and the wind's blowing this way, they might just mingle around you know, do whatever and kind of work their way down here and be coming into the field two hours after dark. You know, that's very possible. Um, same with the deer here. They could be working their way down. These are already, these deer already know what's out here. They've been smelling it all day long. And, but my point is, they might come down here and enter the field here. They might come in the corner here because they might catch the wind here and be able to see out there if they're coming before daylight. My point is, they're favoring the area they can wind. They want to be able to smell what's what's out there, especially, you know, when it's hunting season, deer know that we're the primary predator. So your plan when you're setting up in the early season, I'm looking for the epicenter where a lot of the deer are, are coming together to enter these fields. You're going to see key trails coming into the fields. But the night of my hunt, I want to look for what is the downwind side of this food source and I want to try to key in on that. So like if your favorite stand is right here but you're getting a solid wind this way, you might have the good deer slipping around you and actually winding you right when they get to here and, and going back up without you knowing it. They might be far enough away that you don't hear them. There's a lot of times you're in the woods and you look over and there's the deer. You know, it's like, ooh, I didn't even hear it coming. So, especially the early season, the, light, the leaves aren't dried out and crunchy so much yet. And so, okay. Now, let's say, let me just erase this. And I got to speed up a little bit here because, um, you know, I only got a little bit more time and I want to open it up for questions. So, okay, let's say you're hunting pressured areas. So, the deer in uh, pressured situations, they're going to get up close to the end of the hunt, like or the end of daylight but they're not gonna move much more toward the food source down here. So these deer, they might get up and they might just hang out right here. And you know, if there's anything for them to eat and they'll wait till it's dark and then they'll start moving down. 
Um, what you need to do is, like say there's a deer here, you need to give yourself an extra two hours or whatever. You need to spend the energy of your time getting to your stand quietly, but you need to get up closer to them. Now what this means is a much harder hunt. That's why us public land hunters have a harder time sometimes. Uh, but we need to get, you need to get closer to the bedding area without spooking them. You just, so you don't want to get right on them, but within a few hundred yards, if, if those deer are just getting up a little, like that last 45 minutes of daylight and mingling around, then you're just going to have to do your best. But if you're sitting down here and these deer are getting up and just hanging out up there, you're not going to get a shot anyway. And so you, you, you've got to work hard is the bottom line. When I'm in this kind of a situation, I know I'm probably not seeing these deer over here. I'm definitely not seeing these deer over here. I'm probably not seeing these deer over here. So I have to really hone in on where do I think the deer I'm after is bedded and how can I get within a few hundred yards of that before it's going to be dark. So, um, you know, and I, you know, if this is your only hunting spot, you know, it's going to be tough for you. That's why I like to pick so many different spots on public land. Um, you might just want to come in, take a super long time to get up to that spot and hope for the best, you know. Um, but so I want you to keep that in mind. If you're hunting pressured situations, the deer might not be showing up here till it's too late. Okay, so you're wasting your time sitting there in a lot of situations. Um, now, let me just erase this real quick. All right. Now let's... Uh, that could still be the top of the mountain. Let's say, now I hunt Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, a lot of these states, oak trees, and I mean, I've hunted Illinois, Iowa, and there's a lot of oak trees out in our country. And they, are, they become primary food sources for the deer, especially wooded deer, you know, where there's not a lot of crop fields around. And um, huh, this, is, this is a terrible drawing, but it's to illustrate something. This is supposed to be some form of an oak leaf but the point of that is there's rounded edges, and here's another oak leaf, and it doesn't actually look like an oak leaf, but um, I'm not, I am, by, I was never good at art and drawing, as you can see. But, so there's, a, there's an oak leaf with rounded edges, and that is just so bad, let me try again. Um, and I'm sure you're laughing right now, and that's fine. Feel free to laugh. Uh, and just go, oh my gosh, this is so, this is like America's Funniest Home Videos right here. Um, <laughs> The thing I want you to focus on is the edges. These have rounded edges, and it looks more like a, a sad Christmas tree, I know. Um, and these have pointed edges. In general, when you're looking for white oaks, they have white or rounded lobes, and the bark is kind of a whitish tint to it. Your red oaks are going to have pointed leaves, and it's going to be a darker, a lot of times a smoother bark. And this is what you want. You want the rounded, you could have red oaks dropping acorns like crazy around your hunting spot but red oaks are they are bitter and so a lot of times the deer will let them sit and they'll come and eat them in the spring like you'll find pockets in the springtime especially if you're out turkey hunting where there's deer scat everywhere and it's usually a lot of times it's right around the red oaks because the red oaks have sat through the rain and the snow if there's snow if it's a snowy region and it's washed out some of the turbidity during the winter time and the deer are hungry that's when they're eating it they're not usually eating it during hunting season. This is what you want. You want the white oak. So when you're out scouting, and you should be about done scouting now. That scouting is just about over. Like, I mean, I scout, I mean, August, the beginning of August is your hardest scouting and stay out of the woods. But what I do is I carry binoculars. And if, I mean, the oak trees start dropping acorns in July. For those of you who spend time in the woods, you know, a lot of times there's acorns on the ground in July. They're dropping the early, they're premature a lot of times, but a lot of times the trees are dropping them, whether it's just they have an abundance or there's a, maybe there's a drought, they start dropping acorns. But not every tree. So I would have my binoculars, and when I find a white oak, I'm standing under it, even if it takes me 20 minutes to say, can I see any acorns up there? If there's no acorns, I'm wasting my time hunting here because the deer come there, because there's food there, you know, when they come there. If there's no food there, it's not going to draw. You could, you could be thinking, oh, this is a great spot. I'm going to get a deer here. And you're like, why, why am I not seeing deer? It's because the deer know where the food is, and that's where they are, especially in the evening hunts. So let's say there's, um, uh, let's just, I'll put R for red oak, okay? Let's say there's red oak everywhere, all over the place here. There's a white oak right there. There's a red oak here, red oak here. There's a little white oak here. 
and let's say a white oak here and some more red. So these are your oak trees scattered around. And let's say the only red or excuse me, white oak that's producing is this one right here. And this one's not, this one's not. Usually though, if, if one's producing more or producing, they kind of go in cycles. But let's just say for this example. So this is what you want to find that. And this is like the same as your crop field. The deer that are bedded here, the deer that are bedded here, the deer that are bedded here, a lot of them are headed there. So you've got to now hunt that, that location like you would that crop field like I talked about earlier. Where are the epicenters, the, the core movement corridors headed to that tree? Well, that's what you got to, I say, where are the deer bedding? So if there's deer bedding here, obviously they can walk right down to it. Deer here, they're going to come like this. So if your tree stand is right here, that's going to give you a shot both directions. That's where I'm putting my stand in a lot of situations. And I'm only going to hunt this, like maybe when there's a, a wind that's coming this way, so the deer above me on that hill are not winding me. And then hopefully when the sun's going down, I'm going to catch that thermal in the evening. So right there, that's when I'm hunting the spot. And so you got to try to, in those situations, you know, you got to figure out how are they getting to the food source. Um, I'm going to tell you another story too. And it's, this is, makes it so clear and important. Oh my goodness. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to cut myself off and check if there's questions um, because I have to stop at like 10 of so they can get their next show going. So um, anyway, I hope that's clear. Um, as you can see, I can really talk. <laughs> um, but in your hunting spots, okay, identify those key food areas and then you're, you're going to set up on that. Now, and let me just throw this in because some of you are wondering what about in the morning? In the morning time, you know, deer are headed from key feed areas to bedding areas. And so a lot of times they're on key trails and then they filter out into bedding zones. So what I like to do, and I'll just say this real quick, um, let's, say, let's say the deer are hanging out here most of the night, just for sake of example. And there's key trails that come across the hill here and maybe they come up and go like this. And let's just say that's kind of your key trails. Deer oftentimes will walk the key trails until they get closer to bedding areas and then they disperse. They get off of those key trails and they wind, they, they send, check the areas where they want to bed down and eventually they bed down. But they, they do a lot of meandering before bedding in a lot of situations. And so for you as a hunter, if you can identify some spots along these key trails before the filtering comes off, we're, we're going to start breaking away from the key trails. Uh, I don't, I'm not, don't sit right on it, but like maybe, I don't know, let's say there's a couple good trails coming from feeding toward bedding. If you can make a shot to both and you can, you can sit it when the wind is coming this way in the morning, well, that's a good setup, okay? And so on those key trails, before they start to filter out, if you can find some good locations, that those can be good uh, setups in the morning. So you're, you're kind of focusing more on travel corridors. Oof. Okay, uh, please start firing away your questions on my Sean's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel. Um, I am sorry that I talk so much, but uh, I feel like that, you know, hopefully that was some good information. So um, I got a computer set up here. Um, and the first question I see is, what should I do if deer bedding is not on my property? How do I find the deer in the daylight? Well, that's a good question. I don't know how much land you have, but one thing you can do is create a bedding area. Like even if you only have 10 acres, I have a friend who lives in a suburban area and there's a guy that lives near him who shoots like a 160 class buck every year. And the guy's strategy is this. He said, so many people focus on making food plots. He's like, I don't make any food plots. I make a bedroom and the guy has like 10 acres. He makes a bedroom and he made a bedroom in the corner of his property. He planted all kinds of briars and thick, nasty stuff, and he never goes in there. He, that's a part of his property he never puts foot in. And um, the deer just hang out in there, and he just sits on the outside of it during hunting season and waits for them big bucks to come out. Now, let's say you can't do that or you don't have enough land to really create that in your um, situation. I don't know how much land you're working with, but one thing you can try to do is give the deer a reason to be on your property. If you can't create a bedroom, try to create more food opportunities and then figure out how are they getting from where they're coming from to these food opportunities. And so uh, you're asking me how to find the bedding in a certain sense. Maybe you can, 
identify some key trails that are coming in and coming going out. And when you're on those trails, or even take a rake and rake the leaves and everything off, off the trail so you got dirt. And so you can see which way are the deer tracks going. Are they coming to my property here? Well, that then you know where they're coming from and try to identify. Now, if you can't get permission to hunt the areas where they're coming from, again, that's where you're going to have trouble. Um, maybe you're going to need to try to ask some permission. But as far as finding out where they're bedding, unless you can follow the deer back to where they're coming from and see what's back there. Is there thick stuff back there? Is there something that they're preferring? And where is that? If you're not able to do that, that's going to just inhibit you. If you can talk to neighboring landowners and say, hey, do you mind if I just, I don't want to hunt your land. I'm just trying to figure out how the deer are getting to my land. And do you mind if I just take a walk just to see where they might be coming from or whatever? They might let you, they might not, but you never know until you ask. So. I, that's my best effort in answering your question. I hope it's good enough. Um, if, a, if a person has never hunted deer before, would you recommend going out with someone who is experienced? How does one find people that can teach people new to deer hunting? And that is Daryl Love. Okay, uh, it's, it's definitely good if you can get out with somebody who has some experience. Um, I set up a video on my channel um, to try to help people find other people for hunting. Like this guy was in Pennsylvania, he messaged me saying, do you know anybody in my area? I tried to like recommend a few people, but I made a video and I said, if you're in Pennsylvania and you're looking for people to hunt with, comment below and try to network with each other. So um, there are forums out there for hunting and for archery. You can look into some forums. Um, you know, Daryl, if you can tell me real quick what state you're in, um, maybe there's some people who are watching who are in your state, and you can, you know, hook up with them. There's a lot of people commenting in the feed right now, so, you know, you can try to see if anyone's, you know, answering that. But I do recommend, if you can, um, hunting with somebody. If you can't, I have a whole playlist on my channel called How to Hunt Whitetail Deer. I actually made it one of the cards if you're watching, well, you're commenting on my channel, so you're probably there. There's a card called How to Hunt White Tailed Deer. There's probably 30 videos in there, and it's tips to try to help people like you learn tricks and tips and the ropes to be successful. And there's so many people, I get emails all the time from people saying that these videos help them get their first year. So hopefully that will help you. Uh, that's why I designed my channel the way I did. I tried to make it a resource for people like you. Uh, to learn from and there's also a playlist called how-to videos there's like how to butcher a deer on the ground in the woods there's how to gut a deer I mean stuff like that um, but ask around I, I go to church and funny enough that is a huge resource like I sometimes stop and ask a couple people some questions when I'm visiting my relatives or in-laws I'll talk to them about people in their church. Hey, is there anybody here that wouldn't mind me coming hunting if I want to come hunting here? You'd be surprised at how much feedback I get. So if you have any channels like that, it doesn't have to be church, but any kind of social networking out there, start throwing the question, hey, I'm looking to, to hunt. I'm looking for somebody to hunt with. Do you know anybody? And that can open some doors for you. All right, I think i got time for one more question. Um, what, let's see. Let me see here. Uh, looks like I already answered that question. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I actually, wait. Uh, I think that's it. That's the only question I'm seeing, um, which is good because I'm, I'm basically out of time. Uh, so let me, just, let me just throw this in there. First of all, I want to thank all of you who are watching right now. I'm passionate about what I do. I love hunting. I'm very grateful to Botech for... Um, kind of reaching out and, and offering me the, this partnership where we're working together um, to sh provide this content for you. I'm sort of the, the information provider, but they're passing this out through a lot of information streams through their website, their YouTube and mine. And, and, and so it's a, it's, it's a neat opportunity and I appreciate that. If you're not currently a subscriber to my YouTube channel, I really ask you to please do that and click the bell icon which notifies you when I make an upload. Because if you don't, then you're, you won't necessarily be notified. YouTube doesn't just notify you when I upload. It's unless you have the notification turned on. 
And um, I, my goal, folks, if you would please help me reach my goal. When I went into this year, I wanted to reach 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and I'm nowhere near that. It's been a slow growth. It's been a constant growth, but it's, it's been slower than what I've said. I've tried a lot of different things, but I'm, I'm now asking you, the viewer, help me out. You know, post some stuff on your social media and ask your friends to tune in, watch some of my videos, subscribe, tell them, hey, this guy's trying to um, grow his thing. Let's all pitch in and help him out. And, you know, don't forget, you have the opportunity to win a free Botech Rain 6 just by voting for the guys in the map reading challenge. That information is going to really be hitting hard in a month. So please stay tuned for that so that you learn how to win, but you also get to meet these guys and really be part of this community. So I'm going to cut myself off. I want to, again, thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, I'm going to talk about the pre-rut and rut that week before the rut kicks in, it really starts to kick in, and then during the rut, because our, our strategies are going to be different than what we talked about tonight. And um, I want to share some of my thoughts with you and hope that you can put that in your toolbox to be very successful this hunting season. Thanks again so much. God bless you all. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Peace out, y'all.